you just got to, you know, you got to spend a little bit of time just reminding yourself that you're pretty too, I guess. <laughs> Welcome, world, to another episode of Nobody's a Nobody podcast with me, Mike McVeigh. This is the podcast where I interview people I find absolutely fascinating, and I believe you will too if you give them a chance. This week's guest is the guitar Zan, Michael Frizanke, and Jarvix's Hot Dog Song of the Week is featuring Hometown Christmas by the Imaginaries, and they have a wonderful music video that was shot in Chickasha, Oklahoma, so definitely check that out as well. Our nonprofit is Our Neighborhood Empowered, oneokc.org, and they have just recently received a grant from Thrive that will allow them to help reduce teenage pregnancy and STIs and help make the world a better place. But you are able to help them for as little as $5 a month in their coffee club. Again, it's oneokc.org. And our business shout out, shout out business, eh, whatever, is Rodeo Cinema here in Oklahoma City. And Rodeo Cinema is located at 2221 Exchange Avenue. And you can also reach them at 405-235-FILM or rodeocinema.org. And they show movies in a drive-in style. In fact, right now they're showing uh, The Midnight Sky and Wild Mountain Time. And on Christmas Day, they're going to be featuring Wonder Woman 1984. It's a great way to support local community business and also watch some great movies. So check out Rodeo Cinema. All right, this week's guest, Michael Frizanke, the guitar Zan, is someone that I met through Toastmasters, but we really don't talk about Toastmasters hardly at all. And I will say that Toastmasters, one of the great things is you do get to meet a lot of interesting people who have a lot of stories to tell. But Michael and I met in Toastmasters. He has been a guitar everything for so long. We're going to have a song featured by him. And we talk a little bit about teaching and what it means uh, to be a teacher and to be taught. So we're going to jump right in like we normally do with Michael Frizanke, the guitar Zan. You put on this really cool concert uh, with a guy who I'd seen when I was a kid, Edgar Cruz. And you guys did a two-part show to raise some money for PCBC? We were raising money for the Lexical Toastmasters. That's right. That's right. Is while you're part of PCBC. Okay. At the PCBC's location, right? Right. Right. Okay. And um, so that's where I think you and I really started connecting more, not just uh, like, oh, hey, yeah, I remember you from that contest or I remember you from Toastmasters, but it was from that concert that you played with Edgar that really, I think we started contacting each other and texting each other and, you know, uh, causing problems for each other uh, that we're still continuously doing. Uh, Something like that, yeah. So for those who do not know who Edgar Cruz is, shame on you. Uh, (laughs) But Edgar Cruz is a classical musician, uh, specifically guitar, and has put out, I think, like 20 albums of classical music. Most of it's been uh, covers of other people's stuff. And then he put out two or three, I think, of his own. Um, How did you get to know Edgar? Well, Edgar was the brother of my guitar teacher, Mark Cruz. And I studied with Mark Cruz when I was at OCU. And at about that time, no, I'm going back. That's how I got to know Edgar. I should tell the first time I saw Edgar first, and then I can tell how I got to know Edgar. The first time I saw Edgar was actually at high school. At Edmund Memorial High School, we had the option of either staying in class in sixth hour one one day or getting out of class to go see a live guitar player and so we got out of class and went to see the live guitar player if we had our five dollars which i did bring and got to see him play and so that was actually my first introduction to any classical guitar of any style and he did a show and made a big impression on me for a variety of a variety of reasons And then I believe that was my senior year. The next year I went to OCU to study with Mark Cruz. And then over that time, I kind of got to know Edgar a little bit here and there also, because I was just a little bit more comfortable with the Cruz family. So if I'd see Edgar playing around somewhere, I'd walk up and talk to him and say, Hey, I'm a student of your brother. And we started chatting at that time. And then just being a professional in the business, you kind of get to know each other, probably got to know him the best uh, while I was teaching at OCU because I had him come to performances there. And so that's probably what 
sealed our relationship a little bit more to know actually knowing each other. Now you mentioned that the way that Edgar was kind of your first dose of classical guitar. Had you been playing guitar before you went to that concert or what was your musician like life like before that concert? Well, I've played music my whole life. I, I started when I was very young. The parish priest taught my dad and I and another group of people at the little Catholic school I was going to. I was going to St. John Nepomuk in Yukon, and the parish priest, Father Elmer Schwartz, was my first guitar teacher. He taught my dad and I and some other people to strum a few chords. We would play a few songs in church, and that was kind of how I got started. I was a very, very mediocre player. <laughs> At that time, I, what I did was all right, but I just was sort of about as dedicated as most first and second graders are to anything like that. So I just sort of dabbled in guitar for a long time. I think my first real strong musical experience was in the in the high school band. I had a great experience, actually started in middle school playing the saxophone, played all the way up through my sophomore year of high school and had some excellent band instructors. And so that's what I consider to be my strongest musical experience before, before college. And then I did, uh, I did start taking guitar lessons a little bit, had a really good teacher after, after in high school also, Danny Vaughn, who teaches jazz and taught up at OCU and probably practiced about as well as I did in first and second grade at that time too. So I uh, had, had a good teacher, but probably wasn't putting forth my best effort until probably college. So basically had a really good experience in the high school band, dabbled with guitar here and there, and then somehow found the uh, ability to get serious uh, in college and take my, take my practice a little bit more seriously, put in the kind of time it takes to, to try and excel at a musical instrument. Now, did you go straight from high school to college or did you have any time in between? Straight there. Just went straight from one to the next. And OCU, I just want to clarify, that's Oklahoma City University? That is correct. Formerly they home of the Chiefs a... and now home of the Stars, I think? Yes, that's right. We were right. the Chiefs and now we are the Stars. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, because um, my family... When we went to be, or they went to BNC, and then it became you know Bethany Nazarene College, and then it became SNU, Southern Nazarene University. While I was in, uh, actually, about the time that we left uh, the college, and they were the Redskins, and then they became the Crimson Storm. So then my mom went to law school at OCU, and it was the Chiefs. And then like after she graduated law school, they became the Stars. So I've just told her to stop going to college because she keeps on changing the names of everybody. So. I was going to say, she's probably the, the bastion of change. She's helping everyone <laughs> move forward into the, uh, into the future here. Now, did, what, what did you go to OCU to study? Was it to study music or were you going to be like a business major and just did classes for fun? How did, how did that work? I, it's funny that you brought up business major. I, I, I went to study music because somehow, even though I was not really an accomplished musician at all in high school, I somehow got it in my mind that I was going to be a musician. <laughs> and so I went to Oklahoma City University with the intent of studying music. My grandfather at the time was big into making sure everyone took business classes if they could. So he worked on me hard to take some business classes while I was there. And in fact, OCU had a general business degree that you could attach to any major. They might even still have it. I took some of the business classes and I made it through accounting one and two and maybe statistics and I was done. I was not taking any more of that general business degree. So I did give business a shot, but I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't hang with some of the, uh, the more intense entry level classes there. So you're saying that you would prefer to take music theory instead of taking accounting? I would take a thousand hours of music theory over the uh, one hour of accounting. In fact, if I could somehow exchange music theory classes for the little bit of accounting I have to do for my own personal business, just to get it over to the actual accountant to file my taxes, I would do it. <laughs> now, 
did you so you study music were you studying a specific instrument or was it just music proper like i i don't know how music works i know what some of the different businesses yeah what you do typically is you go in with a major just like any other but that major is typically an instrument and so i went in as a guitar major you can go in as a piano major you can also go in as an education major and some other things but Typically, you're majoring in a a specific instrument at the undergraduate level, and you go through on that instrument, and you study that instrument, and then there's a a very wide variety of other classes, and most of the other classes are general music, things like music theory, performing in an ensemble, and, and so forth. So your private lesson is your instrument, and then your classes are are the more general aspect of your degree and a little bit different for education majors because they take several instruments but it's a pretty it's a pretty similar path for education majors now so you just played guitar for approximately 120 hours or 100 hours plus whatever gen ed you had over the next four years or what what does that look like they did they do this beautiful thing for you to uh, save money so to speak in college so Playing a musical instrument is a little bit like the time commitment that a varsity athlete would make. And so you you make a three to four hour a day time commitment to your instrument. Probably probably varsity football players do a little bit more time than that, but probably I would guess three to four hours is a similar commitment to some of the other varsity sports. And you make that time commitment to your practice but you actually only get one or two credit hours a week, uh, a semester for that. And they do that to, to save money. So you're not loaded up with, you know, thousands of credit hours uh, that you have to take for this degree. But what it actually works out as is you'll have 16 or 17 credit hours and nine or 10 classes sometimes <laughs> because your your ensemble will only be one credit hour also. So you're taking a ton of one credit hours and spending a ton of time in the practice room. And you're allowed to extrapolate and, you know, go into more detail if you choose to. You don't have to, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no. The, the, the ensembles typically rehearse for three or uh, four six or seven hours a, a, a week also. And so those are one credit hour a week lessons too. <laughs> so I know c- colleges as a whole, generally you kind of build a certain kind of community and people that you take classes with often. And I would assume this is true with ensemble work that kind of the closeness that you had with your fellow musicians or students when you got out of college, did it feel weird no longer being in those groups anymore? Or was it like finally freedom kind of, well, <laughs> I didn't do college right <laughs> in that sense. So how do you do college wrong other than my route of flunking out? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you how I probably should have done it. I'll start there. How's that sound? <laughs> I think the typical thing that happens in, in most degrees at most colleges, is that I think that you get in with that really tight group of people and you make some very lasting relationships and those relationships typically uh, fuel at least the beginning of your professional career and so i think the same thing often works with with musicians because obviously you spend a ton of time with these people like you were saying you get to know them really well it's very ocu is a small campus and then and then the music school is a small uh, community within that campus and since you're putting all these all this time into practice performance ensemble music theory you're all taking basically the same classes it's like living in a very 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 small town and going to a very very small high school and so you obviously know these people extremely well and that can be a real opportunity because a lot of times people will form groups and start performing professionally even at the college level and then and then maintain some of those ensembles as they as they go outside of college and either work a lot on the local level and a few of them will start to tour and that sort of thing and I don't know if I recognize all those opportunities very well and I'm going to pat myself on the back I was uh, 
I was a little bit of a good looking guy at that time in my, in my life. So I spent a lot of time dating <laughs> and maybe that's just the, maybe that I, I did, I did practice and I worked hard. I, I, I did, I did not, uh, I did not slough off my studies in any way. You were but able to date I, better than anybody else because you really put in the time to date. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and for a variety of reasons, that probably was not the best use of my time. I probably should have dated a smaller amount and spent a little bit more time trying to cultivate some of those professional relationships that were <laughs> that were there also because moving into the music business is not a it's not a smooth transition and i think this is the part that i was most unprepared for you have to be an entrepreneur because you don't well let me let me step back a few people will be able to audition and get into in, into shows and a lot of singers will also will obviously try to do that route they'll try to audition and get into a, a broadway musical or some sort of tour musical or something like that if you play an instrument, you can try an audition and get into the Philharmonic or a similar group like that. And uh, obviously, if you get an education degree, then you can go ahead and and get a job teaching. But for someone who just wants to be a musician, you're an entrepreneur and you're starting your own business. And a lot of times that is some combination of performing and teaching and doing your own thing. but there's not a job application to fill out once you finish uh, college. And that was a little bit more overwhelming than I, than I realized. And I actually enjoy that part of being a musician quite a bit. I enjoy it, but nevertheless, it's something that is, I, I, I didn't go to school to be an entrepreneur. I, I, what I figured out, I figured out on my own, but I also like to spend a lot of time practicing still, so that limits the hours. It's a, it's a, it was a little bit of a world that I was not quite prepared for. So I think that I probably could have spent a little bit more time um, preparing to make that transition from college to entrepreneur, <laughs> entrepreneur, entrepreneur life <laughs> afterwards. So what? How long did, did it take you a standard, the traditional four years to go through college? Or did you do like the extended route like me? No, I did this crazy thing in college where I focused heavily on my musical requirements during the regular semester. And at the end of three years, I was ready to graduate I was ready to go to graduate school. I had an opportunity to study with uh, another teacher in Kansas City and to go get my master's degree in Kansas City. And I had accumulated almost none of my core curriculum <laughs> at that time. And so I did this crazy thing. And I it, it, honestly, it took more politicking than it did work, but I, I, I signed up for 20 some hours one summer and we had we had two summer sessions so it was two six week course six week time periods of about 13 or 15 hours in each i can't remember exactly so obviously i i worked out the schedule which was unbelievably uh, crazy in its own own right, just trying to make all the classes fit together and making sure I had all the opportunities to check all the boxes that a university wants you to. And so that was a, a tremendous chore. And then finding somebody to sign off on this crazy plan was an equally uh, crazy thing. But finally, I found a woman in the music office. Her name was Deb Debbie Music, and she worked in our music office. I guess she was destined to be there. And she was a, a good advocate for me. And she says, I know you can do it. I know you're the type of person who can do it. And she had the power to sign off uh, for the dean for me and put her signature on that line and got me going. So I took almost my whole core curriculum that summer. And it was actually an amazing, amazing experience. It sounds like it would be just, you know, getting through things, but between the teachers 
who had to be very concise in their teaching style because it's a six week, uh, it was a six week semester. We went every day. They knew the capacity that we had to take in information. And so they were very concise in their teaching style. So I think that most of the professors took the summer terms very seriously and they really stepped up their teaching game. And then I was in this sort of hyper-focused learning time and I retained so much from that. And it was just this broad education in, in the humanities. And in a way, it was sort of exactly what college is supposed to be, even though it's supposed to be spread out over many more years. I was just so immersed in, in all these studies. I was writing papers left and light, right. I was taking in a ton of knowledge and I remember a lot of things from that semester, uh, that summer. I, I, it's very often that I'll be in the middle of something and I'll just throw something out that I learned that, uh, that, that summer. And I guess also I took Spanish that summer and actually retained quite a bit of the Spanish that I took and used it eventually uh, when I went to, on a trip to Mexico uh, later on. So I did this three years of regular college and then this hyper intense summer. And then I went to graduate school and did a semester and then immediately had to take one more semester off <laughs> and then went on and off. And it took me four years to get a master's degree after the three years it took me <laughs> to get a bachelor's degree. And you said you focused on guitar. And if I remember correctly, you were one of the very few people that had focused on guitar at that point. Is that correct? As your instrument of choice or? Yeah. I, I think that there were two or three guitar majors there at the time. I don't know if any of the other ones graduated or not. I, I know one guy who was a guitar major at the time ended up still being a guitar major when I came back several years to start my teaching career at OCU and one of my first jobs there was to help him get graduated. <laughs> so he was actually a sophomore when I came to college and someone I looked up to, because he, he's actually a quite good player, Glenn Rosales, but a, a number of life situations had kept him from graduating. So my first job as a teacher was to get him graduated. So we worked together and it's kind of a unique teaching experience because he was still a ridiculously good player at that time. And I just had to help him through the academic stuff to right. get him to the finish line. But yeah, it was only two or three of us at that, at that time. And, and, uh, and that's kind of how it was when I got back to, there's only, only a few guitar majors at that time too. And so after you got your master's degree, you went straight into teaching at OCU or did you do some other stuff? Um, I think it was about five years later because uh, I, I went to, oh, after my master's degree, yeah. No, it was pretty quickly after the master's degree because at the end of my master's degree is about the time, I had a one-year-old at the time and another baby was on the way and uh, my wife and I decided we needed to be closer to our families and both of our families live in the Oklahoma City area. So I'd been working in Kansas City at the time as a, as a church music director. I did that while I was in my master's degree. And we realized that that second baby was on the way. And we said, we need to be closer to family because we need some help. And we picked up everything and moved to, back to Oklahoma City. And I started looking for jobs. And there just happened to be a job open at OCU that was just a very, a very fortunate turn of events. What you're doing. I taught for 12 years there. And then uh, it's been about seven or eight years since, since then. So I taught for 12 years there and haven't, haven't been back. But you still do private lessons. Is that correct? That's correct. I teach okay. privately and perform privately and that sort of thing. Gig and perform and teach. I've always kind of been curious on teaching how, how you deal with the ego struggle or how I would deal with the ego struggle of being decent at whatever subject I'm teaching of. Otherwise I wouldn't be teaching it, but then to have a student that far surpasses like my skill level or my talent level. And have you had very many students like that? And if so, how did you like purposely fail them just to show them what's up or, you know, how do you deal with that? 
No, I've never uh, purposefully failed anyone or anything like that. Just accidentally, huh? No, haven't done well. <laughs> I've tried not to fail any of my students. I, I'm sure I have failed a few at, at some places. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it, it's a common thing, actually, to, to have students excel so high that they, that they in some way surpass you. And it's a humbling thing, of course. It's a humbling thing. Even at the college level, it was pretty common, obviously, to bring students up to, up to that level because you have, you have students that are investing their life and they want to be they want to be a professional. And so, you know, anytime you're bringing someone up to be a professional, they're going to be a unique artist and they're going to have their own set of skills. And some of those skills are going to be better than some of the skills that you have. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, it's a very humbling experience, but it's even more humbling when you start to teach mostly high schoolers, which is what I do now. And some of those, uh, some of those people <laughs> start to excel at such a high level that you just got to yeah, you got to spend a little bit of time just reminding yourself that you're pretty too, I guess. <laughs> so, I mean, what, what do you do the, and I mean this very seriously, like how do you deal with someone that has that talent? Um, I mean, obviously you're still teaching them, but how do you get the, how do you keep pushing them forward or what kind of things do you do to help them not get limited by your talent or, and again, I'm, I'm thinking of myself, you're probably not untalented enough to have to worry about that, but I always worry that I would hamper somebody's skill level if I wanted to ever teach them something. Well, at some point it doesn't be, it's not so much about better or worse. It's, it's about variety. And so most people who get up to a high level in a musical instrument or any art form have two or three very particular things that they're very, very, very good at. And so what often happens is that student will be, will have a slightly different skill set. And so up to a certain point, the skills are very, very similar, but as they grow and start to become a unique and individual artist, they're going to want to cultivate a set of skills that is slightly different than me. And that's especially when they start to do things that for example, there's a there's a skill called tremolo that I've been working on uh, for most of my professional career. And to be honest, I'm pretty mediocre at the at the tremolo. But I've had several students who have been amazing at the tremolo. And so this is one example. But actually, since I've been working so hard, I've read a lot about how to do it. I've studied a lot about how to do it. I've read a ton of different people's uh, methods or blogs or exercises or all sorts of different. So I've actually accumulated a huge amount of knowledge about the tremolo, even though I'm pretty mediocre about that skills and which makes me not that much better, but it is getting better over time, but it makes me a pretty darn good teacher because I have all these resources to draw on. And so a lot of times that that's one sort of way that it'll happen is you'll study a skill that you're not necessarily excellent at and you'll acquire all this knowledge and then you'll have all that knowledge to pass on to your students. So that's one thing that'll, that'll typically happen. Another thing that typically happens is you've spent more time with this music. And so if there's a piece that a piece of music that a student is really, really excelling on and even going at a higher level, I've still spent more time on the general practice schemes and, and this that, that will that they'll need so for another good example i know i'm I, I i'm having a lot of thoughts and that's why i'm having to I'm trying to process them all so a lot of times what i'll do when i'm working on with a student is maybe i've played that that particular music piece of music and they're playing it better than me but i've still played it so i know where to put my fingers and i can i can check uh, I can check to make sure they're doing it right and that they're not missing notes or rhythms or anything like that. And then I've most likely listened to a few professional recordings of it. So I know other ways it could sound besides the way I play it. And then a lot, I spent a lot of time working on practice schemes. And so I think, well, what are the practice schemes that help me get this other piece of music that I can play at a superlative level? What 
what helped me get there. So a lot of times I spend a ton of time on just how they practice, how they break up their time, what exercises do they do? Do you go through the piece three times? What do you do when you make a mistake? Do you go through twice, but go over this one section 15 times? Just the mechanics of breaking down a practice session. So those are two very practical answers to your question. But a big part of the answer is more about psychology. Because what happens is, is you spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one individual time with a student and you get to know them and you get to, you get to know their quirks and that sort of thing. And then I personally have spent a lot of hours with a lot of individual students. So you kind of start to understand how groups of people relax, react to certain types of challenges. So I'm doing a lot of personal coaching and helping them deal with um, the, the challenges they're particularly facing. So we do a lot of talking as, as someone advances, we're doing a lot of talking and talking about what are their own personal hangups that are, you know, that are keeping them from taking this thing that they're doing really good and turning it into, into great. And so there's a lot of just personal, personal coaching in, in that goes in it as well. And that makes sense to me. I I think one of the reasons why some areas I've not tried to move forward in my own life, uh, mature-wise, I'm not mature enough to say that I'll put my own interest behind <laughs> as a second place to the other person's interest because I still have things I want to do. And I think I'm getting closer and closer to being in that spot where I can honestly try to mentor somebody with not going to get jealous if they have better results than I did. <laughs> I'm still not quite there yet. <laughs> I, I've actually, I, I have a couple things to say about the mentor program. If you, if you'll allow me to go off for a second, cause I've actually had a great experience. The first one is about art mentoring in general and speaking obviously is an art, just like playing guitar is and art mentoring in general. It's all about developing unique personalities it, at some point in time it stops being about who's good and who's better and that sort of thing and it becomes about helping people cultivate a unique product which is their stage presence and their their specific speech and so I never really look it's a little easier in Toastmasters it's a little harder with guitar I'll admit <laughs> but I never look at another fellow Toastmaster as, comp as competition except for when we're doing the competitions, but still that's just a very small, small part of Toastmasters. But I don't look at someone else's competition because their goals are always different than mine and their product is always gonna be different than mine. And so that's how I deal with that because I, I work a lot with Josh Kane and he helps me as well. And, you know, head to head, I beat him in a competition, but he's come along and he, kicked my butt in the last com competition and it'd be easy to focus on that. But honestly, our goals are just so different that we're really, we're really just helping each other develop our own individual product. And I think when you start to look at arts mentoring that way as cultivating individual products, rather than seeing who's better, that's a big, a big tool. As far as the mentoring program specifically goes, I noticed in my guitar teaching, I've had a, real hard time transitioning people from a, a, a set curriculum because I always start everyone on a set curriculum but my goal as a teacher is to help people transition from a set curriculum to making artistic decisions themselves because ultimately there's a million things that I could possibly teach them and it, it doesn't make any sense unless the person is starting to cultivate their own their own interests and you know at first it starts off with well I just like to learn this little song or you know then I'd like to get this set or maybe I'd like to go out to an open, open mic and I've had a difficult time transitioning especially young people from that accomplishment mode to the artistic mode and the artistic mode is often a lot more powerful when you're coaching people because then that's what also helps people develop their own personal incentive to practice and to improve and all those sorts of things. So I started the mentoring program with, with that in mind. And the mentoring program has actually been excellent for me. Um, I, I will say this, that I, uh, I 
ran cross country and track competitively in high school. And I was pretty decent at the high school level in Oklahoma, but all in all, a pretty mediocre runner and certainly not an athlete that could transition to college or anything like that. It took me decades because I still, I still ran for physical fitness. Uh, I, I still keep running for physical fitness and it took it took decades to get to the point where I can go for a run purely for pleasure without trying to keep track of a time or improve myself or, or something along the line. And so when you get heavily into that competitive mindset, and you're right, it is good at times. But when you get heavily into that competitive mindset, it is hard to turn it off when when it's not appropriate. <laughs> it's nice to have that skill, right? Because being being able to be in competition mode and being able to be in co- accomplishment mode those are important things right i like ac- accomplishing accomplishing things is amazing but it's just being able to turn it off when it's appropriate is the <laughs> yeah and so I, I i'm actually very very interested and in, uh, i'm really grateful that you've shared the insight about how you deal with guitarists that might have more talent and stuff and it makes perfect sense for the things that i've read and the things that I've uh, like about Michael Jordan in particular, um, that you still put in the work, you, you learn the art or you learn the craft and then you make the art kind of thing. And that really goes well with what you're, what you've been saying. Along the business line, interestingly enough, I have what I jokingly refer to as a, how, how do I say that? A, a master's, in a self-appointed master's in um, popular business <laughs> because I've read at one point in time, I'd read all the major popular business books on how to make a million dollars. <laughs> Essentially. I read, uh, I read one, my guitar teacher, a former guitar teacher of mine wrote called how to make a million dollars playing guitar. I read all the, uh, the rich dad series. I read, you know, just all, all sorts of all sorts of things like that. I'd read a ton of those books, but they were actually one thing that was actually very, very uh, meaning. So I guess my grand the first point I was going to make on that is I guess my grandfather did uh, influence me somehow. I did eventually get back to what he wanted me to. But especially one thing that I noticed is that is that all the books talked about product differentiation and finding your niche market and that sort of thing and especially it just after hearing that time after time after time it just really really started to click that with artists that's actually really really true is that it's not about i mean because we could sit here and debate all day who's a better guitar player jimmy page or um or Eddie Van Halen, right? And then someone can say, well, I think Andreas Segovia, the great classical player, is way better than either of those two, and so forth and so on. And we can debate all we want, but at the end of the day, they're all masters and they're all they were all highly successful and highly influential and highly respected. And it, it, we're, we're, we're quibbling over minutia. We're, we're being fans and quibbling over minutia, but from their perspective, they're all incredibly successful musicians. And I think that same thing really applies not only to, to businesses, but it, it applies to being in the workforce, you know, because obviously if you're in the workforce, you have a specific set of skills that you have to do for your job. But ultimately the people who thrive, who are the people who really bring their own little take on, on how to, how do you sell clothes at a retail store in the mall? How do you, uh, what's your little, routine for handling driver's licenses or whatever it's ultimately your your individuality that makes you thrive in a even in a corporate setting i think yeah you're absolutely correct i think that's one of the things that gives me so much excitement for you and some of the projects you're you're doing right now with trying to put yourself out there i mean you i'm assuming that one of the reasons why you got into music specifically for degree wise was to be a performer and that was what you wanted to do maybe i'm wrong but would that or am i wrong is that what you originally got into music for music i mean i think i just had this vague idea of what it meant to be a musician that was largely informed by what the record industry 
sells, right? So the, the record industry basically sells, and this isn't a bad, a bad thing, but it's essentially they sell us bands who at least we perceive that they are creating their own music and performing it. And so I, I believe that's what uh, that perception is what I sort of wanted to be. Obviously, as I got into music, I learned about tons and tons of different aspects uh, of music. But I think ultimately the performer creator is, is the, is the thing I enjoy. I enjoy playing my own music that I've written for other people and then playing the, other music that other people have written that I think goes well with my music. I, I like the fact that you have a concept concert pretty much every time you play. Um, <laughs> and I know uh, I'm trying to remember the exact name. It's, it's, you call mismatched it mismatched covers, mismatched covers. Yes. And you take a theme and then you find music that either fits every genre or you play that song in a different genre that might not be what it was originally written in, but you might play, you know, me and Bobby McGee and more of a jazzy version instead of what we would hear with Roger Miller or Janis Joplin. So talk a little bit about how you, why you decided to start doing these um, mismatch cover concerts and stuff. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's a great question. And so there was a couple, there's a couple of major influences on, on the uh, on the mismatch covers, and that's kind of a big answer. But uh, I'm I'm going to talk here a little bit until you wave me off a little bit. And the first major influence was that concert that you saw with Edgar and I, because I've always believed that ever since I saw Rob Capello, I've always believed that it's possible to make connections with general audiences no matter what you play. And at the same time, I'm also sort of realizing that I have a wide variety of interests. I like uh, instrumental music. I like um, jazz, uh, rock, classical. I like songwriting. I like just guitar. I like a whole lot of uh, things. So I had this before the concert with Edgar, I was operating under this general idea that if I got one thing going, then that would give me other opportunities to get my other things going. And it made sense to me that since I was trained as a classical guitarist, well, I'll get the classical guitar going and then that'll give me more opportunities to get my songs out there and that'll give me more opportunities to get my ensemble work and so forth and so on. And you, know, you just start making connections and other opportunities to do all the things that you do well. And so I got together I, uh, my little concept set, as you say, I liked that. That's, that was a pretty cool thing. I might have to use that uh, at, at some point in time, but I got together my little concept set and the, the title of the set was It's All Rock to Me. And I put together on that set some of my favorite classical guitar pieces, but they were specifically pieces that when you heard them, you were just kind of like, yeah, that's awesome. And I had seen people who are not musicians have similar reactions. So I knew that that was, that that was something. And then I, for good measure, I also threw in Eruption by Eddie Van Halen, and Eruption is about as close to a classical guitar piece as there is in, in a rock uh, setting. And I had two or three guitars out there. And so I was trying to get the whole show going. I was trying to talk in between. And I, I feel like I was pretty successful with doing that. And it was sort of that success that helped me realize, okay, there's still some problems with this concept as far as, uh, you know, I say business, but what I really mean is reaching people and developing a fan base because I realized that even in this very straightforward from my perception concept, it was still a long ways from where most of my audience members were. So after that, I decided what I needed to do was regroup <laughs> and say, okay, which of my, instead of saying which of my ideas am I most accomplished at currently, which was my classical guitar, I said, which of my passions is the most crowd friendly? <laughs> and then I can start building, building from there. And so that's when I got the, that's when I was sort of encouraged 
at that time to um, really focus on getting my songwriting going. And I'd, I'd been a songwriter and I'd written many songs before that, but really just start to take myself a little bit more seriously as a songwriter and put together a group of songs, which is now my album, 10 Year Crush, which you could not buy as a recording, but it is uh, something that I did self-publish and, and the, music is, the music is available for purchase. And so I got that together, which is probably one of my most palatable marketing uh, ideas as far as getting my music out there. And of course I can work, work in a song or two of my own into the, into the theme and uh, always try to work in one or two of my own as well. All right. So I don't know if you have a guitar handy. Uh, we had talked before. I didn't, I forgot to mention it earlier, but do you have a guitar handy that you want to play I, us one of your songs? I do have a guitar handy. You like babe? Is that the one you I do like babe? Um, That's so the opening that's the opening song on my 10 year crush album It was uh-huh. a kind of a interesting story. Cause I wrote the, I wrote babe in my writing style. I just have this style where I, I, I don't even really consider it brainstorming. I just sit down and whatever comes to mind, I put it down, which is a little bit like brainstorming except for in my mind, brainstorming usually is around a certain topic. And this is usually a lot more random <laughs> than that. I do make the, requirement that i need to stick stick with an idea at least until the song comes out uh, and it's entirely even if the song is a little bit random all right so we have michael frizzanke playing babe from 10 year crush mm-hmm. here we are at the mall side by side I'm so enamored just like when we first met I don't know anything else And so we take it slow Day by day Happy outside I'm so enamored just like when we first met No matter what our life brings I'm going to whisper every night you do the uh mismatch covers on instagram every thursday and remind most me most thursdays times. most thursdays what what times are those i know you usually do two up two sets two shows six and eight p.m most thursdays on instagram live and that's central standard time and you can find him literally at michael frizzanke so just look at the spelling on the cover we have here michael frizzanke on instagram and you do not have to follow him to follow him but it makes it better um he does do local concerts when he's able to uh, like full circle bookstore as well as some other places. And Michael, I'm very glad and thankful that you were willing to let me interview you. Um, you, you help me regardless if anybody else finds any help from it, which that's really what this is about. Um, me being able to talk to people I find absolutely fascinating and keeping record of it. And hopefully other people find that you're as fascinating as I find you. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate this opportunity. Hot dog. Hey listeners, it's Jarvix again with my hot dog song of the week. In the spirit of Christmas, which is just a few days away, I'm bringing you a holiday tune called Hometown Christmas by an Oklahoma husband-wife duo. Maggie McClure and Shane Henry are two very talented singer-songwriters in their own right, but together they form The Imaginaries, a fuller band project that has an identity of its own. 
The Imaginaries have been playing their cards exceptionally well since starting out just a couple of years back. They've been catching radio play, earning magazine features, and finding fans all over, even raising over 20 k for a debut studio album via Kickstarter from their network of supporters. Last year, they put out a Christmas album called Hometown Christmas, which is a collection of both holiday classics and new originals. It's full of songs that would be at home on any wholesome seasonal playlist. The Imaginaries boast bright, consistently sublime vocals and know their way around a time-tested song structure, drawing from both traditional pop, folk, and blues singer-songwriting styles. In the title track of the album, also called Hometown Christmas, you get more of that folk flavor than on other tracks, and it's not an arbitrary choice. A slight sentimental twang is just the thing for a song about coming home for the holidays and gathering with friends and family at the end of the year. Though the song came out last year, its music video only just released in November of 2020. It's yet another great fit for the lyrics, as the whole thing is shot on location in Chickasha, Oklahoma. The Imaginaries have a following beyond the Oklahoma state border, but for this song they made a point to go local featuring area businesses and, of course, the town's renowned Festival of Light. The video is also sharp and quite pretty. Given that Maggie McClure also has a legitimate resume in acting, I'm not surprised that The Imaginaries keeps the bar high for such work. Although I don't personally celebrate Christmas, even I can pick out a good Christmas tune when I hear one, and this is one of them. If you agree, be sure to also check out that video which has a nice end tag that will probably resonate with you as well. You can catch all of it at their website at imaginariesband.com, where you can also join their mailing list for news and updates. Here is Hometown Christmas by the Imaginaries. <laughs> The plane. And I've been working so hard these days And I can't wait to cross that county line And be back in the place that I call home I feel that hometown Christmas in the air It's an open invitation, everyone is welcome here
Thank you to the Imaginaries, to Michael Frazonki, Jarvix. Check out Rodeo Drive, Our Neighborhood Empowered. Happy holidays to everybody out there for whatever you celebrate or don't celebrate. Happy birthday to my dad, 70 years old. You are officially an old man. Everybody has a story that is worth listening to. Nobody is a nobody. And that means you. Until next time.